Daily digital news. Bits and bytes connect our world. September is coming to an end, but the events around the UAE and right here in Sharjah are only going to be kicking off starting from the end of this month. In the UAE, we're talking about a first of its kind metaverse event that is going to be kicking off on the 28th of September. Dubai Metaverse Assembly is going to be highlighting the potential of what an immersive world is going to look like and what we will need in terms of technology to be able to survive in it. Yes, now the UAE is set to host this first of its kind metaverse event in the region. It's a very big feat that is going to happen. Now, it is organized by the Dubai Future Foundation, and that is under the patronage of Sheikh Hamdan bin Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, who is the Crown Prince of Dubai and the chairman of the Executive Council and chairman of the Board of Trustees. And it will be held at the Museum of the Future and even Area 2071 on September 28th to the 29th. Now, the event will feature 300 global experts and even more than 40 organizations that are specialized in the metaverse and even virtual world applications. And more than 30 local and international leaders are expected to speak at the two-day event. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is a very, very big event and a historical event as well as it is the first of its kind and it is the metaverse and even... Just last week, uh, we did see Mark Zuckerberg talking about the three phases of the metaverse. And he just went and announced that we are in phase one of the metaverse. And a lot of people don't even realize it yet. Yes, indeed. And speaking of big names coming to the event, we're also expecting the Minister of State for Artificial Intelligence, Digital Economy and Remote Work Applications. His Excellency Omar Sultan Al-Ulama, who's going to be joining the event as well. We're looking at more than 25 sessions taking place different meetings and workshops that are going to be educating the public about different topics like building a metaverse what is the scalable metaverse infrastructure that we will need right here in the uae and different business friendly regulations and government services that will be taking place in the digital world now we've constantly been hearing about the metaverse but a lot of people actually don't know what it is and don't know how close it is to us and how a lot of the things that we do in our day-to-day life just like we live a life in the real world we will soon be also living a life in the metaverse so it's a very exciting event actually to kind of push for the metaverse across different businesses and different governments as well yes and again ladies and gentlemen uh, you know the metaverse a lot of experts are saying it will break social media we won't be using social media anymore after the metaverse has become full set and in motion so it's always better to get on top of the train or get on the train at the first stop and you know be aware and well informed of what is happening in the metaverse as it will play a very important part in our lives and it is very obvious as the UA government has been adapting a lot of metaverse technologies already 4215 ladies and gentlemen let us know your guys thoughts we are taking a short break but when we come back we're talking all about UAE's first astronaut who will serve as a backup on Sultan Nayadi's six-month mission to the International Space Station. Daily Digital News. Bits and bytes connect our world. Ladies and gentlemen, UAE's first astronaut is going to serve as a backup on Sultan Nayadi's six-month mission to the International Space Station. Now, Hazal Mansouri, who is the first ever Emirati in space, will act as a backup crew for his colleague Sultan Nayadi when the latter does embark on a historic six-month mission to the International Space Station. Now, this does come on the third anniversary of UAE's first ever space mission, and we have been looking at how the UAE has been very prominent on sending Emiratis to space and, you know, continuing the research that they did pledge to do. And, you know, we've been, let's say, doing remarkable feats the past couple of years, you know, from Sultan, from Hazal Mansouri to Sultan Niyadi, mm-hmm. and now, you know, the, the, the whole probe, and we also have a different team getting ready in Texas to go to the moon as well. Yes, indeed. Now, looking at it, Sultan Niyadi will take on the first Arab long-duration astronaut mission. He's going to be launching to space, and as we've mentioned, Al Mansouri is going to be the backup crew. Now, looking at it, the backup crew is actually just as important as the main astronaut, because at the end of the day, if anything were to happen, if any last-minute changes took place, or emergencies, God forbid, let's say one of them didn't feel well, the other person is going to be ready and set to go on that mission. Now, on this day, actually, 
three years ago, Hazal Mansouri launched to space and his all of our hearts actually followed him um, on that launch pad. So at the end of the day, both of them are actually very crucial to this mission. And looking at it, this is going to be the first Arab look at the International Space Station station on a long board flight. Six months is not a short amount of time and it's actually going to give all of these astronauts a pretty good idea of what space actually has as an impact on our bodies. Hazan Mansouri is actually very excited about this new mission because looking at it, he's going to be a part of a much bigger team and they're all going to be collaborating to bring back lots of knowledge uh, right here on Earth. And the mission that uh, Al-Mansouri took place with uh, as part of the International Space Station a couple of years ago actually helped the UAE become at the forefront of uh, space explorations. And looking at it, the six month long International Space Station mission is going to be taking off in the spring of next year. And we're looking at them uh, actually helping us reach a new milestone and achieve a much bigger goal. We're also looking at more missions to come, one of them being the moon mission that is actually scheduled to take place very soon. We're looking at it being on track for launch in November this year and we have a lot more updates to come as well. Yes, and again, ladies and gentlemen, the space sector for the UAE is a very new sector that they have been dominating so far as every time the UAE does not embark on something new, they always, mashallah, they dominate it. So again, looking very forward to what is going to be happening in the couple, next couple of months and couple of years when it does come to the UAE space sector. Let us know your guys' thoughts, 4215. But we are taking a short break, and when we come back, we have a live interview with who, Omnia? We have a very interesting conversation with Dr. Suhail Dahdal, who is the head of the Mass Communication Department at the American University of Sharjah and the founder of the Fifth Wall Immersive Media Lab. It's a, it's a conversation that you don't want to miss out on. Keep Pulse 95 locked. We'll be right back. Future Talk. This is Future Talk with Omnia Al Saleh and Hany Balkis. The secret to powerful storytelling is to allow the audience to live in the story. And this is actually a very interesting topic because once upon a time, whenever we used to visit a museum, the only way for us to learn more about the different artifacts is to kind of read the blurbs that are found under every artifact. But these days are long gone because in the near future, we're going to become a part of the story thanks to virtual reality and augmented reality. Joining us today is a very dear guest to our hearts. Dr. Suhail Dahdal, he's the head of the Mass Communication Department at the American University of Sharjah. He is also the founder of the Fifth Wall Immersive Media Lab that uses technology to put the audience in the story for the educational realm. And I must say, he's also, he used to be my professor. So, very, very warm story to my heart. Welcome to the show, Dr. Suhail Dahdal. Thank you, Omnia. It's good to be on the show. Um, very happy to be on this side. As before being your student, I mean, we have a lot of stories to tell, but we leave it to outside the show. But yes, I'm happy to be on the show and happy to contribute. Happy to have you here, Doctor. You know, uh, let's get started with, you know, how in theater and film, the story is told what is known as, you know, the three walls of the set. Now, Dr. Sayed, can you talk to us about the founding of the Fifth Wall Immersive Media Lab and how is it changing the storyline of storytelling? Well, um, I just want to start with a disclaimer. I'm, I'm a very big on the art of storytelling from a mm-hmm. traditional point of view as well. So I, I believe that technology is there to serve the story and therefore uh, Fifth Wall is not about taking the story out of its meaning, which is mm-hmm. beginning, middle and end. I mm-hmm. think that's really important. But it's about putting that audience within that structure that is engaging, that allows the audience to live the story, but still within this frame of suspension of disbelief that makes the audience actually live the story and so there's always a delicate balance of the interaction and that's where fifth wall came from the whole idea is that uh, usually we have the 2d screen sometimes it's 3d Mm -hmm. and sometimes you see you know like an actor talking to you so Mm -hmm. they're breaking that wall and they 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 jump and suddenly they are in talking to you directly Mm -hmm. fifth wall takes it one step further and rather than you just sit, sitting back and, and have stories come to you, you actually are uh, immersed right in the middle of the mm-hmm. story. And, and that's what makes Fifth Wall a little bit different than, than, than other concepts because we're not just talking about technology, we're talking about actual traditional storytelling, but allowing the audience to live within that story, experience it in ways that has never been done before. 
Absolutely. And that's a very interesting aspect because, uh, you know, when we talk about storytelling back in the day, the audience or just the viewer in general, we're just witnessing the story unfold right in front of us. But in the new technology that you're talking about, the audience is actually becoming a part of the story. So in your eyes, how has the role of the audience changed over time? Well, this is a very interesting story, concept because like storytelling has been there from the old days where, you know, from the cave dwellers mm -hmm. typing a little, little <laughs> thing. And if you remember in, in I our remember classes, in your classes. <laughs> yes, all the way to this new modern technology where I might say actually there's even less interaction now and you see like a kid just zooming through TikTok videos quickly, totally. Uh, actually, uh, there is a bit of a separation, although they are immersed in the content. Mm -hmm. What we want to do is actually take us away from this new way of just looking at a two-dimensional screen and, and living the story. Add a bit of mobility, a bit of actually interaction, which is really important, mm -hmm. and at the same time preserving the power of the story. Because one of the biggest problems, and it's a delicate balance, is how can you actually add interaction Mm. How can you actually make the audience live within the story and not lose that beautiful essence of, you know, like the, the cinema language? Mm -hmm. So if we look at history and back to your question about this history of how the audience relationship with story has been, and we look, you know, for example, I want to go back to like that first footage of the train when, you know, the audience ran away scared from <laughs> this train on the screen, yeah? Because they're not used to it. True. And there's always this, it's true. And so there's always... Uh, this kind of thing of we learn a new technology and then we learn how to tell stories in these new technologies. Mm -hmm. And then also the audience, it's a symbiotic relationship between the audience, the technology and storytelling. And the one constant thing is the storytelling, but then technologies come in and storytellers try to figure ways to use this technology to tell stories that can interact with the audience. Mm -hmm. And where we are now, we are actually at a very interesting, at the cusp of a very interesting period where we might, we have not yet figured, we mm -hmm. might figure really good ways to actually have the audience in the story and yet keep them engaged. And this is this is the ethos of what I'm trying to do. Mm -hmm. You know, I, 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 I'm putting a very ambitious kind of goal, which is to preserve that beautiful narrative storytelling and yet allow the technology to kind of serve that story. So suddenly we're one level up. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and what I would say is that this has not been done yet anywhere, but what I would say is it's very close to be done and I want to be one of the first that can participate in this kind of experimental mm -hmm. period now. That's yeah. amazing. And we want to be one of the first <laughs> to also witness it, Doctor. Now, you know, I think it's beautiful what you're doing because also we can know that, you know, in this day and age of technology, you did mention TikTok and the young children. And, you know, unfortunately, because of TikTok and all these social media, we have a short attention span and we need something to grab us in <laughs> real quick. So why not something immersive when it does come to storytelling? I think you hit the nail on the hammer on that. <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. We're going to be taking a very short break, but when we come back, we're going to be diving a lot deeper into how AR and VR are actually making an impact when it comes to storytelling. Both technologies were actually viewed by many in the past as gimmicky, only Im implemented mm -hmm. in gaming, but now they're having a much bigger role that we're going to be diving much deeper into. Keep all 75 locked. We'll be right back. This is Future Talk. Future Talk. Future Talk with Omnia Al Saleh and Hany Balkis. Across societies and cultures, stories have always fascinated us. Not only do they help us spread and develop our culture, but they also sometimes give us an escape from what we may think as a mundane world to live in. But the future of storytelling lies in making the experience a lot more personalized for the audience and bringing them in even much deeper into the story itself. Joining us today is Dr. Suhail Dahdal. He is the founder of the Fifth Wall Immersive Media Lab that uses technology to put the audience into the story. It's been such a great conversation conversation with you, Dr. Sohail. And now we're going to go into the deep topic. So a lot of the times in the past, whenever AR and VR are mentioned, they're usually mostly the center of attention in gaming, in, in different concepts than storytelling. So in your implementation of the technology, artificial intelligence is becoming in service of the story. So how were you able to make that shift and make use of this technology? Okay. Well, I have to step back a little bit to talk about, to put my other head on, the researcher head on, <laughs> which is to say um, that for, you know, for the last 30 years, I've been working with interactive storytelling, and there's always been this vexing, this problem, which is technology 
is there to serve the story and and enhance it and enrich it. Mm-hmm. Yet at the same time, it becomes a little bit of a handle. How do you find that balance where you actually take the best out of that technology and make it serve the story without losing the story at the same time while you're doing this? There's always this problem of as soon as you apply the technology, like you said, it could become a gimmick. Mm-hmm. And therefore, we're more immersed in the technology rather than immersed in the story. So how do we use technology and stay immersed in the story or enhance our immersion of that story? And this is what my research as a researcher has been for the last five years. Mm-hmm. And two interesting things that we kind of found about this uh, that I apply in, in, in fifth wall and comes there artificial intelligence. But just to mention these two things first too, so you can understand the context. Mm. One of them is that uh, one of the issues is uh, when you actually use the technology and you actually try to interact with it, you are you break your suspension of disbelief, which mm. is a very important tool of cinematic or storytelling tool, which is you feel like you're not anymore within the story. So it's kind of counterintuitive because immersive is about putting you more into the story. But as soon as you start clicking things, you're actually mm-hmm. less in the mm-hmm. story than the traditional. And that, that's usually a, a big, big, big problem. And the second issue is that all the new technologies, you know, augmented reality, it's it's really cool and fun. And that's actually a problem is that there's something called the novelty factor. What happens is that you're excited with this new headset, you're excited, and you're not actually really concentrating on the story. So these, these are, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, these are, so these are two issues that we have to eliminate hmm. in order to actually unlock the potential of these technologies. So one of the things that we invented, well, I, I don't want to say invented, but we, Implemented. Mm-hmm. Implemented, but also created. I don't know if there's any other places that have done it. Maybe mm-hmm. independent others have done it. But we've created this artificial intelligence gaze, which is similar to our natural gaze. So what happens is that when you inside a story that we create in Fifth Wall, you do not click anything. You mm-hmm. simply walk in that story. Mm-hmm. And a bit of an artificial intelligence that recognizes one is that, are you looking at something? Or are you glancing at something? Or are you intensely looking at something? Mm. And therefore, based on these kind of different phases, because you might actually go quickly and just glance at something, Mm -hmm. or you might go quickly and see something and say, ah, this is interesting, but then shift. Or you might see it and say, this is interesting and stay intensely looking at it. Depending on what the AI recognizes in your action, they give you a different type of the story. Mm -hmm. And therefore, so therefore you seamlessly are actually uh, interacting with uh, something while you're not interacting. All what you're doing is being naturally gazing. Mm. And therefore, mm. therefore, we're not breaking your suspension of disbelief. So that does this, this amazing thing. The second thing that it does is you're not really involved with the actual technology itself and you forget it after a few minutes. Therefore, it also takes that novelty factor out of it. So, so we're actually uh, double dipping in that kind of technology and we end up with the bare minimum of using the power of immersive but then the rest is about the storyteller creating a really engaging story. That's the second level of what we do is understanding how you can create an interactive story that has multiple options. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, this is, and, and then at the same time, make it seamless and one thing. So we create a lot of loops that connect to each other, make up the story. We also use the special audio, by the way. And, you know, you guys are, you know, doing this in radio. Audio is, is key. Oh, and definitely. As well. <laughs> But for us as well, I think audio is so important, especially because the new technologies allow you to do spatial audio, which means you can pinpoint, you can put a a person somewhere, and then as you have the headsets on, you know exactly where that sound is coming from. And if you turn your head, the sound also turns with you Mm. and understands that you're actually moving. So it also gives you that sensation that you're moving in the spatial sound, not just moving in a visual forest. Mm, that's amazing 100% I'm really excited to see it but I want to ask you doctor why is it important to use this immersive technology in museums okay this is a good point and kind of leads me to what we're doing now which is we're working with the Sharjah Museum Authority to Mm -hmm. try to I don't want to say bring the museums into the future Mm -hmm. but maybe bring the future into the museums Mm -hmm. (laughs) somehow (laughs) so we're trying to actually use technology uh, to enrich the stories that are in a museum uh, but also in a way that doesn't obstruct the sanctuary of a museum. Because I believe that there's also, there's, and I remember once like um, this art historian that's telling me how, what they enjoy most about the museum. And they said, we enjoy the quietness where we can go and think and imagine. The okay. peace of it. 
is, but also the space where you see something, but you don't see a lot of it. And then you can leave some for your imagination. Mm. So this is the thing again, is about finding the balance where this is why augmented reality is so useful because augmented reality is not obstructive, which means you can see everything in the museum as you want. And then if you wish, you can get more information when you wish mm. at your desire, which means uh, you still can experience the traditional museum. And then at any moment, if you find an object that you're really, really interested in, you intensely gaze at it. And then suddenly it unlocks this <laughs> magic of, you know, storytelling coming out of that object. You know, it's amazing with the technology that you're mentioning is that the technology is in service of the story and the audience instead of it being in the spotlight, like we've always seen with different implementations of AR and VR. We'll be taking a very short break, but when we come back, we're going to be diving deeper into this topic, as well as talking about what the future of media education is going to look like and how immersive technology has a big role into that as well. If you have any, any questions for Dr. Suhail Dahdal, make sure you share them with us at 4215. Do it a lot. Future Talk. This is Future Talk with Omnia Saleh and Hani Balkis. I came across a very interesting statistic today and I thought it was very fitting for today's topic. They say a good story is 65% emotion and feeling and they couldn't have been more right about that because at the end of the day, as an audience, when you are feeling with the story, when you are feeling like you're a part of it, you become more inclined to focus on it and at the same time become it envelops you instead of you just witnessing it. Today on the show, we are honored to host Dr. Suhail Dahdal, the founder of the Fifth Wall Immersive Media Lab, as well as uh, the head of the Mass Communication Department at the American University of Sharjah. He's been telling us all about how he was able to create a very good tool out of AR, VR, and AI to make sure that the audience becomes a part of the story instead of having the technology itself be the center of attention. Dr. Suhail, before this, before the break, we were talking all about the importance of making sure that the technology does not take away from the story. But my question to you is, how can we make sure that the audience has a little bit of a role in the story itself? So is there any way that they can maybe uh, become a part of how a story begins or even how it ends through these technologies? It's a really, I mean, you're asking me a really tough question. It's maybe getting back to getting me. Getting back to you. <laughs> <laughs> but no, no, it is a hard question because the answer is yes, we are at that research that, where there's conflicting research. Mm. Because uh, I'll tell you my personal uh, opinion and also the ethos of Fifth World, but there's conflicting research because there's some research that says you have to use immersive technologies, AR and VR, with minimal interaction, where the audience does feel like they live in the story, mm. but they only like kind of a bit like a flaneur or mm. like someone lawyer because any interaction breaks that suspension of disbelief. Like a Having fly said, on the wall, basically. Like a fly on the wall, like mm. the old cinema birthday and documentary. But having said that, there's also an alternative opposing side of research that mm. says, the reason why we're saying this is because we haven't yet found the tools of interactivity that are actually engaging enough and are part of the story or they can be part of the story. And I think that's a very interesting premise. Uh, and it go, it akins to the concept of, you know, in the old days of camera, and I always like to use history as a way because the future is history as well. Mm -hmm. in, the old days, in the old days of camera, they figured out this new technology, but they used it exactly in the same way like the theater would use it. So they would have it there and the film would just play without editing. Then slowly there's a new cinema language that developed. And what happened is there's a new audience contract. The audience started understanding new little tools like a dissolve, super mm -hmm. flashback, all these tools. And then that became part of the storytelling. So the technology had little interaction tools that are part of the storytelling. Mm -hmm. I think the problem at the moment and the solution for it as well is that with immersive technologies and with AR and VR is there isn't yet a good uh, to all uh, put immersive mm -hmm. uh, uh, language for storytelling. Mm -hmm. And I think we slowly will start developing this in a way that the audience will be more engaged. And I agree with you, this is the second level engagement where the audience is actually changing the story, you know, mm. different endings. And, and the problem of different endings is, you know, there are films that were done that way for many years, mm -hmm. but none of them has been successful, successful enough to keep the suspension of disbelief. Mm. So at the same time, we're working on AI and creating stories that are uh, 
you know that the user lives in the story we're also thinking of new ways to interact with with with, with the with the user and uh, funnily enough uh one of our projects that we're working on and that i think is really really interesting is uh how do we actually use both mm -hmm. not just visual but also audio mm -hmm. to create interaction for example one of the things that users can do and they haven't been doing a lot is actually speak mm. and the technologies now allows us to recognize that they're speaking mm -hmm. where they speak from what they, are they saying and implement that within ai to actually create an interactive with them so that that's the second level of interaction of course the other levels which is the most obvious one is using your hands yeah yeah, already using the interaction of the eyes, which is the gaze. That's mm -hmm. one interaction. But like to answer your question is that there are many ways where the audience can interact. Mm -hmm. uh, that that old notion of clicking on something for interacting <laughs> is out of the window. The new ways of interaction is what we would say natural interaction. Mm -hmm. Whether whether it's gasping because they're scared from a scene, whether it's actually turning their head quickly, whether it's running, whether much it's more running. natural much more natural i think that that will increase the story then you add you add that one last dimension i know we would run out of time i could talk about this for hours <laughs> I, he's so passionate about it i love it <laughs> yeah but <laughs> we could um, the other thing is script writers mm. script writers have to really find ways to script stories that work with this interaction mm. because you, know, you don't want to you want to create it's a delicate balance between it's an ecosystem yeah yeah it's an ecosystem with multiple branches that all of them has to work within that narrative arc. So it becomes mm. a little bit more complex. And we haven't got yet that many experienced interactive storytelling. Absolutely. So. Hani wants to ask about your second half now. <laughs> yes. Now, uh, you know, Professor, you are the head of department at the mass communication at AUS. And, you know, I want to ask you, what do you think the future of media education? What is it going to be? Okay, well, I think it's interesting. I'll start by saying, for example, I teach a subject called social media. Mm -hmm. And every semester, did you take that subject with me? Already? I didn't, but I know people who did. She <laughs> smirked, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Luckily, you didn't. Now, every, every semester, the subject changes totally. So we're talking about like media education uh, at the moment is playing catch up mm -hmm. somehow with technology and with the industry. And what I want, and I think what's really interesting is as a future of media education is give it a bit of leeway and connect it more to the industry. Mm -hmm. So I'm working like in a small steps through, you know, my new role as a head of um, the mass communication department is to make sure that one, we have a stronger connection with the industry. So we know all the new trends, mm -hmm. so we can implement them in the programs quickly because what happens otherwise is your students will finish three years and then what they learn is a little bit obsolete. So. So what we want to do, we want to stay ahead of the technology. So that's one thing. The second thing is that trying to really implement in the program new ways of storytelling. For example, like in, uh, like immersive technologies are here. We know that in the future, journalism is going to have a lot of elements of, you know, there's already a lot of, actually, there's even AI journalism these days. True. But, yeah, but then there's also like some beautiful work that's been done by New York, uh, New York Times with, with, with immersive technologies. So we know that in the future, the industry will also demand students mm -hmm. or graduates that are able to understand these technologies. So we're trying to also teach things that are at the you know frontier of, of not just not just technically, but conceptually, the frontier of storytelling and frontier of journalism and advertising looking at things like augmented reality for advertising immersive mm -hmm. journalism or journalists implement that in our programs mm -hmm. skill our students enough to do that but also stay with an eye to the industry and have that kind of connection that is really important Thanks. absolutely the future looks very bright the future <laughs> does look very bright and dr Zell, he hit every nail on the coffin and i believe i mean we could go on for a much <laughs> much more but unfortunately we don't have much time left but Dr. Sayer, thank you so much for giving us, you know, this window to look at what might the future hold for this. Pleasure. I'm happy to help. Anytime you want me to talk, <laughs> two hours, no problem. We're going to have you on speed dial, doctor. <laughs> exactly. Thank you so much, Dr. Sayer, for joining us. Everyone, we truly hope you've enjoyed this hour with us just as much as we did. And we cannot wait to be back with you tomorrow. Same time, same place, bringing you the latest innovations taking place right here in Sharjah and all around the UAE. Future Talk is coming to an end, but our shows on Pulse95 will be continuing with the halftime show kicking off in less than four minutes. Keep Pulse95 locked. We'll see you next time.
you liked this episode of Future Talk, drop a like and subscribe. Be sure to follow us on Instagram for all our daily updates and top stories. Future Talk.